ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان سيدنا ومولانا محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى اله واصحابه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا اما بعد اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قال الله تبارك وتعالى يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارحام ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا صدق الله العظيم اللهم صل على سيدنا مولانا محمد كلما ذكره الذاكرون وصل على سيدنا مولانا محمد كلما غفل عن ذكره الغافلون اللهم صل وسلم على عبدك ورسولك اللهم صل على سيدنا مولانا محمد افضل صلواتك My respected brothers and sisters and honorable elders السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته Whenever the topic of Islam comes up with our non-Muslim friends and colleagues, we often hear them say that Islam oppresses women. or women are the second class citizens in Islam or something to that effect something related to this issue you will hear them say and it's not strange that we hear them say these things because the propaganda that's been <coughs> being pushed by the media and by those who are trying to instill the feeling of hate towards islam and towards muslims is actively working to towards achieving that goal but the truth is completely different from that the issue is actually twofold those people who have these kind of disturbing perceptions about islam in their mind they believe in these things because most of them have a very superficial knowledge of islam So most people have very superficial knowledge 
of the teachings of Islam. What Islam really teaches to men, what Islam really teaches to women. And the second issue is that many of them don't even know that not only Islam but Christianity and Judaism which are the predecessors of Islam they have similar teachings regarding women and no religion, none of these religions really oppress women it's a completely wrong fabricated notion and idea that somehow Islam oppresses women and mainly it, it, this idea is born out of this notion that whenever non-Muslims see Muslim women with a headscarf or with modest clothing, they think that that is a symbol, that is a sign that this woman is being oppressed. Whenever I hear a comment like that, I ask the same people that, why don't you ask the woman, why don't you ask that same Muslim woman if she feels that she is being oppressed? Or that she is being wronged? If she says yes, by wearing the headscarf or by dressing modestly, she feels that she is being oppressed and she is losing her freedom, she is losing her liberty, she is losing her rights, then you would be correct in believing that Muslim women are being oppressed. Once in Canada, a woman was, was walking with her husband and she was dressed modestly with proper clothing and with a headscarf and there was a group of young girls and they were walking on the same sidewalk. They suddenly stopped as they saw this Muslim woman in her headscarf and this modest clothing. They stopped her and they said, pointing towards her husband, why do you allow him to oppress you? And she stopped and she said, what makes you think I'm being oppressed? And she said, Look at you, how you're dressed. And these girls were barely even clothed. They were half naked. So this woman was very well educated. She was actually a professor in a university there, in Ontario. So she said, what makes you think I'm being oppressed? And the answer was, look at you, you're covering your hair, you're, you're covering your body. Isn't that the sign of oppression? She said, if that's the sign of oppression, then I would prefer that oppression over what you are doing. You have no clothes on your body. You are deprived of modesty. You are deprived of shame. In the name of that freedom, in the name of that, in the name of that expression, you have no sense. You have no idea what freedom is really like. And then she said to her that it's not you who's benefiting from that. It's the other people who are really benefiting from this dress of yours. So you are living the life of a slave. Because you're doing this for other people. You, you are not doing anything for yourself. You're living the life of a slave where you have to worry about how other people will look at you. And this is why you have to wear makeup, you have to 
have your dress in a certain way and you have to have everything presented in a, in a way so other people will praise you and not look down upon you. So you are really what I feel sorry for. You shouldn't feel sorry for me because I'm living the life of choice. I'm living the life of freedom. I don't have to worry about how people look at me because I don't show them my body. You, on the other hand, li are living like that. And when she heard that, she was just, just furious. What is this woman talking about? And she spin around and she left. But the truth is that Muslim women are the ones who are enjoying most freedom in the whole world. Because Allah has given them their rights. Human beings can never decide for each other what, what right they should give and what right they should take. For that, we have to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Creator, the God, the Almighty, who has the power to determine, who has the power to decide who gets what and who does what. These are the things that we leave up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because we, in our distribution, we can never be fair. Men will always incline to favor men and women will always incline to favor women. But Allah, who's above and beyond all of that, Allah is the one who is just, who is fair, and who can, without any bias, without any prejudice, without any sense of injustice can, can decide what is the share of men and what is the share of women. What is the responsibility of men and what is the responsibility of women? After all, Allah is our Creator. When you make something, you know the ins and outs of that product. You know how the engine works. You know how the body works. You know how every joint is made. So you know where there is a weakness and where there is a strength. You can decide as the maker of that product what's good for this and what's not good for this. What this product can take and what this product cannot take. When you buy a car or when you go into an elevator, you see the sign that says the capacity of this elevator is 200 pounds or 600 pounds or 1,000 pounds. That means those people who made that elevator, they know that if you put more than the, more than the allowed capacity of that elevator, then the elevator will break down. It won't work or it will have a fatal failure that could cost the lives of those people who are on that elevator. Allah is our creator. Allah created men and Allah created women. He is the one who gets to decide what the responsibilities are for men and for women and what the rights are for men and women. But in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, everybody is created equal and everybody is treated with the same standard. Just like men have to work to earn Jannah, women have to work to earn Jannah as well. Just like men have to pray, women have to pray. Just like men have to fast, women have to fast. Just like men have responsibility to raise children, women have responsibility to raise children as well. And this sense of 
oppression towards women, it can easily be refuted. A few years ago, Gallup did a survey in many Muslim countries, in eight Muslim countries, where the majority of population is Muslim. And they only surveyed Muslim women. And they asked about what's going right and what's going wrong and all of those things. They asked for, for they asked women to point out the problems that they're facing or if they're being oppressed or treated unfairly. And majorities of those women who were surveyed, they said our biggest problems are the lack of unity amongst Muslims, amongst the Muslim countries. And our biggest problems are the, the political and economical corruption that is destroying the Muslim countries and the failure of reconciliation. None of those women who were surveyed, who were questioned, ever raised the topic of headscarf or the dress. They didn't even mention that it's the headscarf that's keeping us behind. They didn't even complain that it's our clothing, it's our dress that's, that's, uh, that's oppressing us, that's keeping us behind, or that's, that's being unjust and unfair to us. They did not even complain. And although it is an obligation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for women to cover their head and dress modestly, but beyond that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not impose a specific a specific style of dress, whether it's American, European, Indian, or Middle Eastern, or any other style. Every religion, every region, and every culture has its own dress style. Women in America dress differently than women in Middle East, and women in Middle East dress differently than women in India or Indonesia. <coughs> Islam does not get into that. Islam does not say that the Indonesian dress style of women is, is good and the American style of dress for women is not good. As long as it's meeting the standard practice of modesty, dressing modestly, Islam will say, yes, that is the <coughs> Islamic dress. Islam has given that instruction. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who has given that instruction. And that headscarf is worn by women out of their free will and choice. <coughs> Men do not force their women that you must do this. And that is the case in almost all the Muslim countries. It is true that women do suffer in many Muslim countries due to many unfair practices. But those practices have nothing to do with Islam. Those are cultural practices that people have not let go of. People are still holding on to those cruel Cultural practices may be the honor killing or the female genital mutilation or other practices. Those things have nothing to do with the teachings of Islam. And that's a problem across the globe. That's not only a problem in some Muslim countries, but that's a problem which is more like a regional problem. And that's common in Muslim and non-Muslim countries. 
where the majority of population is Muslim or even where the majority of population is non-Muslim. But it is unfortunate that we tend to point out when there's a problem in a Muslim country, we tend to point that out. And when the same problem is there in a non-Muslim country, then we forget about that. We have to develop fairness and balance in our judgment. How we see people, how we view people. We do not discriminate. That is something that goes against the most fundamental teachings of Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave equal rights to men and women. And Islam raised the status of women. Islam sees women in one of four pictures. A woman is either your daughter or your mother or your sister or your wife. And each and every single one of these categories have an enormous amount of respect. You must respect your mother. You must be kind to your daughter. You must be polite to your sister. And you must be loving towards your wife. None of those ranks have any, any tolerance towards injustice or towards harshness and rudeness. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the ability to understand the teachings of Islam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to practice upon the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa There's a request for dua for Brother Muhyiddin Sayyid's mother-in-law. She has cancer and she is in a lot of pain. She is in India. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take her pain away. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give her shifa. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant her comfort. Please do not forget all the people in Syria, in Palestine, in Iraq, and elsewhere who are deprived of even the basic necessities. There are, there are so many children, families who have no home in Syria. And it's winter over there too. Maybe not as cold as here, but it's still very cold over there as well. And it's a very, very difficult time for those people and the least we can do is we can remember them in our prayers, in our dua. We never know when the dua may get accepted and when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give them relief and comfort and peace in their homes. Tonight, inshallah, we will have our uh, monthly community dinner. Uh, we invite all of you, inshallah, to join us. We <coughs> originally uh, had requested uh, Brother Fayez Ahmed from Brown University to come and speak about Islamic history. Unfortunately, he is sick. We ask all of you, inshallah, to make dua, and he will not be able to make it. But we will have our halaqa, inshallah, uh, after Salat al-Isha. So dinner will be at 7 p.m., Salat al-Isha will be at 7.30, inshallah, and after Salat al-Isha, we will have our halaqa, inshallah, the halaqa of hadith. We request all, all of you, inshallah, to join us tonight at 7 o'clock, inshallah. Uh, finally, uh, we have, inshallah, uh, we have uh, contacted uh, Adam Travel for an uh, Umrah package. Inshallah, next month we will be uh, going for Umrah 
for a week-long trip. And those of you who are interested to join us uh, on that Umrah trip, it's just a week-long trip, inshallah. We'll be leaving on March 14th and returning on March 21st, inshallah. And the price for the total package is very reasonable. Uh, we have more information on the flyer. So if you are interested to join us on that trip of Umrah, you can contact Adam Travel directly or you can contact me inshallah. The deadline for that is uh, February 15th. After that, we will send our passports uh, for the visa process inshallah. So uh, that's a week long Umrah uh, journey next week inshallah and I will be uh, traveling next, next, month, next month inshallah. Thank you.